Alrighty, good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 and now verse 17. And the last couple of weeks we saw how Judas would betray Jesus and we saw that he was a thief and that he loved money and he was looking for opportunity to steal from the Lord. And we saw those things. What a horrible thing for a friend to be betrayed by a good friend, by a close friend. Judas spent three and a half years with Jesus. He was part of that inner circle and yet the enemy was there to tempt him and to use him to bring great destruction to our Lord and our Savior. And let, yet the Lord was in control. Well, this morning we're going to look at the Last Supper or what we call the Last Supper where we get our communion from, and it's very, very interesting. In Matthew 26, verse 17, let me read this, and what I'm going to do, try to explain where it comes from and, and its meaning. In 26, verse 17, we read, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to Him, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover? And He said, Go into the city, to a certain man and say to him the teacher says my time is at hand I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover when evening had come he sat down with the twelve now as they were eating he said as surely I say to you one of you will betray me and they were exceedingly sorrowful and each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? He answered and he said, He who has dipped his hand with me and the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man of whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And, and we'll just stop there. But in context, you know, we're kind of going slow, but I don't think we're going that slow. Here, this is their last meal together, hence the word Last Supper. They're celebrating something that the Jews call Passover. Very interesting. As the church, I, I think we're very ignorant to a lot of times to what the Bible's actually talking about. And we can symbolize things or because people don't study the Bible, there's a lot of history and tradition that is super valuable and, and it actually makes the Bible come alive in living color. A lot of people can take this type of teaching and, and sermonize it and symbolize it to apply to your lives, which it does without having to do that. But it's so rich and so beautiful and here we teach the Bible in its entire context from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. We're not shy or afraid of teaching the Hebrew Scriptures, a lot of pastors just like to stay with the words of Jesus or in the New Testament or make up sermons, you know, that, that apply a little sermonette series and things like that. We're not scared of the book Revelation. If you read the Bible in its entirety, and you should, you can read the Bible probably twice a year if you, you know, just a, a 10, 15 minutes every morning. You, you can go through it, a book a day even, it's possible. and. You should, as you read the entire Bible, it begins to make a lot of sense. The whole Old Testament or Hebrew Scriptures all point to the coming of an anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. And the New Testament all points back to what He's done for us. And so you have to read the Bible, you have to know its history, its stories, because they have a lot of application when Jesus is speaking to his disciples. You see, they were Jewish. And as a Jews, they were commanded by God himself to keep a certain feast that we or they call Passover that the Jews celebrate to this very day. And here, um, to understand what we celebrate as the Last Supper, so Jesus changes some things, and the Jews celebrate as Passover, I want to take you back all the way to the beginning 
of Scripture in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 6 to an event with a man by the name of Abraham and his only begotten son Isaac. And this is about 2,000 years before our text here in the Gospel of Matthew 26. So Genesis chapter 22 and verse 6. You go back 2,000 years and, and I want to look at this in its entirety because I think it all ties in together as you will see. 2,000 years before the time of Christ, there was a man by the name of Abraham who is the father of the Jewish nation, the father of the Jews. God picked him specifically. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to give you many descendants and I'm going to use you to bless the entire world or of your descendants, the world will be blessed. So he chose this man by which he would have his own special people by which would later come Jesus, the Messiah, into the world. But there was a problem. This man was married to Sarah and both Abraham and Sarah weren't able to have children and they were up in age and God had promised him these, this promise of a great nation and they lapsed in faith, they were human and yet God did provide to him a son of promise called Isaac who was born when Abraham was old and Sarah was old and this son of promise, can you imagine not having children and wanting to maybe adopt or trying to have children but those hopes and those dreams are shattered with time because now it's probably too late. It was for sure for Sarah. And yet in a late age, a miracle happened. Sarah conceived as the Lord said, and she had a child by the name of Isaac. And this guy, no doubt, was protected. If he got a cold, Abraham no doubt was there, Sarah was there. They, they took care of him, they protected him. For years they've prayed. And yet in Genesis 22, something happens where God, the Bible says, will test Abraham's faith. Now, if you look at it by itself, it seems kind of cruel and kind of mean. Why would God do this? But when you look at it in the entirety of history and the stories that we have here in Scripture, it makes a lot of sense. Sometimes God will allow things to happen in your life that in the moment don't make sense, but maybe a lifetime from now or years from now, you look back and go, okay, Lord, I see it now. I understand. But when you're going through it by faith, you have to obey and you have to trust the Lord. In Genesis 22, verse 6, God commands Abraham to offer up his only begotten son Isaac on a specific mountain as what? A burnt offering. Now, they used to worship God by taking lambs or goats, cutting them, bleeding them, and then burning them on an altar and, and worshiping the Lord that way. And God commands th this to be done to Isaac. And in Genesis chapter 22, Verse 6, the Bible says that Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. He puts wood on Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and he said to his father, Ab Abraham, Father, and Abraham says, Yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here. Um... But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You see, I don't think Isaac was a little kid. He might have been a teenager. Some say he was probably in his 30s, a man submissive to his father. And he's not dumb. <laughs> Dad, you're getting old. The wood, the knife, the fire. But where's the offering? Where's the lamb? Remember this. Where is the lamb? And Abraham says something super important. Put a little highlight in your Bible. 
remember this mentally, underline it if you even want. Very important. 2,000 years before the time of Christ, Abraham speaks prophetically. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And we know the story. The two went together to this mountain. Abraham places his son on the wood. He takes the knife. He raises up his hand and is about to bring it down on his only son. Perhaps Abraham trusting, if God gave me this child, then he'll resurrect him too. And as he goes to strike his son, a voice from heaven comes out. God himself says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Now I know that you will not withhold anything from me. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. And if we keep on reading, verse 12, the Lord says, Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up in the thicket and he saw what? A ram. What did Abraham say God would provide? A lamb. What was provided? A ram. Check this out. It was caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place. Notice verse 14. The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. What will be provided, guys? Remember, a lamb. A lamb would be provided. On this mountain of the Lord, it says, it will be provided. What? A sacrifice. A sacrifice. God Himself will provide the Lamb for a burnt offering, says Abraham, 2,000 years before the time of Christ. Now Abraham's son Isaac has two sons, one by the name of Jacob, one by the name of Esau. Jacob has 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. These boys, as you know the story, would be jealous of their little brother, Joseph, and envious of the love that his father had for them. And eventually, they tried to kill him and stop short of killing him, put him in a hole, and sell him as a slave, where he's taken to the land of Egypt, where he works as a slave for many years, but because he feared the Lord and honored God, he's able to interpret dreams, and God raises him to second to Pharaoh himself. He becomes powerful and very wealthy. And you know the story. Joseph dies. Actually, as Joseph's alive, before I go there, there's a famine in the land, and God uses that to have Joseph feed all the people in the area, including his family who come down from the land of Canaan into Egypt and buy food from Joseph. Long story short, they reunite. Joseph, Joseph forgives them, and he blesses them with the land of Goshen there in Egypt where they prosper and grow and grow and grow for generations to come. But Pharaoh dies, Joseph dies, and a new Pharaoh rises to power who is evil, who is scared that the Jews would rebel against the Egyptians. So he puts them all into slavery. And for 430 years, Joseph's family, the descendants of Abraham, are slaves in Egypt until... Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. Why am I describing all of this, guys? Because to understand the Last Supper, you must understand where Passover 
comes from and what the Jews celebrate as Passover. They're in bondage for 430 years. God sends to them a deliverer by the name of Moses. And with the staff of God and signs and wonders brings plagues to Egypt that finally brings them to their knees. And the message that God has for Pharaoh is thus says the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, they're my people. And thus says Pharaoh, because he saw himself as God, I will not let them go. So plague after plague after plague after plague comes until finally this last plague in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. And here you see something happens. The people are saved by the blood of a lamb. Very important, very interesting. This is not a fairy tale. It's not a story. This is the actual history of something that happened that the Jews celebrate to this very day. Now, if Israel wasn't there, we would, we would be teaching this by faith, but it's there. <laughs> if the Jewish people weren't around, you'd be like, all right, it's just a story. They're around and they celebrate this. Check this out. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, we see that God's people were saved by the blood of a lamb. In Exodus 12, verse 12, we read, On that night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Notice verse 13, underline verse 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, as a lasting ordinance. So we know this story. God gives this command. He says that some people call this the plague of the angel of death, but really God himself came and he struck all the firstborns. But he made a clause. He didn't desire to kill everybody. He says, if you put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your home, I will see the blood and I will pass over you. So the people were to be protected by the blood of a lamb. Interesting, guys. History, actual history. So what happened was all these lambs were slaughtered and their blood was placed in a basin where they would take a branch and, and dip it and then put that blood on, on the top post and on the side post of the house. And then people were probably praying in, 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 in Egypt. And there at night what happened is God came or, or judgment came. And those who had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their homes, the angel passed over. But those who didn't have the blood weren't covered, they weren't saved, and their firstborn died that night. Now it is believed that even Pharaoh's firstborn died. And what happened is, can you imagine, is in every house in the United States of America, in every single home, can you imagine, a firstborn of every single family dies because they didn't want to obey about putting blood. You would have people crying. You would have people in the streets. It would be a day of mourning for sure. Well, that was the final straw. Pharaoh says, get your people and get out of here and worship your God. I'm done, son. Right? And they took off. And they wandered in the desert and they worshiped the Lord. But he commanded them, you will commemorate this day. It's a holy day a holiday, a Jewish feast. So from generation to generation to generation, the Jews have celebrated Passover. And it's a, a meal 
that's very um, specific that is commemorating this event that happened in history, actual history. And every piece of food, every cup they drink has significance and we'll get into it some other day. Um, I'll, 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 I'll share that with you some other day, but everything has meaning or significance. It's a day to commemorate what the Lord has done, how the people were delivered and saved by the blood of a lamb. Now for generations to come, the Jews would wander in the desert. They would eventually cross over and through war and God's favor end up possessing the land that was promised. And for generations to come to the present, the Jews have celebrated that meal, Passover, which is what Jesus and his disciples are celebrating in our text now in Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. You see, we can, without that history, we just think it's the Last Supper and we have communion and bread and all that. They're Jewish. They're eating unleavened bread. They're drinking wine and, and there was different cups in the Seder meal or the Passover meal and they all have great meaning. And our Lord will take the symbolism of all of this and He will say, I am the Passover lamb. I am the one whose blood will protect and will save. It's, it's a huge, very important, significant meaning. In Matthew 26, verse 17, we read, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus asking, where do you want us to make preparation for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city and a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. So interesting. They're basically preparing to make this meal and celebrate it. And lo and behold, this would be the last time they celebrate it together. I can't even say it's the equivalent to our Thanksgiving. Maybe a little bit. Thanksgiving, we have family, we have friends. But there's nothing religious about it, pretty much. It's all very secular. It has to more, more or less do with football, right? Football and Thanksgiving. But if you're a Christian, it has a lot of meaning. But similar to that, it's a special meal. Um, it doesn't even compare... Um, more special because they're very religious, they believed in God, and it's the Lord. <laughs> imagine celebrating Passover with the Lord, and imagine being that man that you're chosen. Hey, Jesus wants to come to your house and use it for a Bible study, and to have a meal, that must have been amazing. So they prepare it. He says, for my time is at hand. This is it. This is it. Jesus knew what was happening. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And now from verse 26 through 25, we see that Jesus speaks of his betrayal. A lot happens on this Last Supper. In John chapter 13, in the context, he begins to teach the disciples something very important. He begins to wash their feet. And he begins to teach them about love. A new commandment I give to you. We know the Ten Commandments. But Jesus says, I give you guys a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. After he washes their feet, he says, if I being your teacher do these things, then you ought to do them for one another. And he goes on to say how a servant is not greater than the master but how the master is to serve everybody. And if you want to be the greatest disciple, you must be servant of all. So he teaches them about love. He talks to them now in context. I know last week we saw about betrayal, but the order goes like this. The Last Supper speaks about betrayal, and then he's actually betrayed. In the Gospel of Matthew, you see that before it happens. So here... 
when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. So this is not a European type setting um, or Jesus in the Last Supper painting where it's Jesus in the middle and you got six guys to the right, six guys to the left, and it's like perfect table. They're all just sitting there. That's not exactly at all how it looked. Think about the Middle East. Pillows on the floor, maybe a short table or even food and dishes on the floor. Um, hummus type, a lot of sauces and stuff. They're eating with, with pita bread. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're reclining on pillows against each other, even where John says that he laid his head on Jesus' breast. So it's very close. They're, you know, they're there just kind of reclined, um, listening to Jesus speak. Notice they were reclining with the twelve and while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. A lot of things come up, but probably one of the saddest is that he talks about being betrayed. And notice that no one said, ah, oh, I know it's Judas. No one recognized him as a betrayer. They were very sad and began to say to him or to one and other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. That could have been anyone. They all dipped, right? They all ate with the Lord. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better if he had never been born. Now, there's different Gospels that we call the Apocrypha. We don't recognize them as inspired by the Lord. There's one of uh, Thomas, one of uh, um, Judas, and they kind of paint a different story. And they're not inspired by the Holy Spirit or by the Lord, and they have a different um, perspective. And in some of them, they, they go on to say that Judas was just a pawn, and he received forgiveness, and he went to heaven. Well, scripturally, Jesus says it would have been better if he had never been born. He is called the son of perdition, which means damnation or total destruction. Judas is in hell for sure. For sure. And yet Jesus loved him. And yet Jesus, as you're going to see, will even call him friend as he's being betrayed with a kiss by Judas. Friend, have you come to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? The whole way the Lord would offer forgiveness but once you die in your sin the Bible says you go to hell and Judas died in his sin without repenting Jesus says it would have been better if he had never been born then Judas verse 25 the one who would betray him said surely you don't mean me teacher and Jesus probably looks him in the eye and he says you have said it. Turn to John chapter 13 verse 27. I find this super interesting. Now there's a saying where people say the devil made me do it. <laughs> no, probably not. He's just great at taking the evil and the lust in your heart and walking you to basically you doing bad anyways by your own free will. In John chapter 13 verse 27, very interesting, the Bible says that Satan entered into Judas. Satan can come against you and you can mess around with that. I'm sure Judas knew for sure this is wrong. <laughs> Jesus is a good man. Jesus is the Son of God. Whatever it was, and he flirted with it. And he, I'm going to go a little longer. I'm not going to repent. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to double down. And eventually he opened himself up to even becoming possessed by Satan himself. Interesting. In John chapter 13, verse 27, we read, 
as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. He became possessed by Satan himself. So Jesus told him, who? Judas or Satan? I don't know. <coughs> what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Now in the context, Judas would go to the temple. Now in the context, Judas would say, what will you give me in exchange for him? And now in the context, he would be counted out 30 pieces of silver. And he would look for an opportune time to betray our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples being Jewish, celebrating Passover, basically commemorating that the people of Israel were saved by the blood of a lamb, were delivered by God himself into a promised land. For 14 centuries, the Jewish feast of Passover had been pointing to the coming of the Lamb. Jesus ate the Passover, substituted in its place his own supper, and then was himself slain as the Passover Lamb. Jesus died on the cross on the same day that the lambs were being slain in the temple. Now because it was Passover, all the Jews were commanded by God to come to Israel, the temple of God, and offer up these lambs that they would have to be sacrificed and taken home and, and cooked and prepared in a certain way to celebrate this meal. All of Jerusalem at this time was packed with many, many people. I think it's been estimated about 2 million people there in Jerusalem. And the priests would have hundreds or a couple thousand of priests just sacrificing lambs all day where that blood would run down the temple into a valley. And as this was going on, remember in context, they were going to remember just a couple weeks ago or a couple lines back in Matthew 26, how they wanted to take Jesus, but they didn't want to do it on Passover because they feared the people. They wanted to kill him, but they didn't want to kill him on Passover because they feared the people. Interesting. Remember when John the Baptist was baptizing, probably a couple years before this time, and he sees Jesus coming. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He introduces him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Very, very interesting, guys. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, we continue. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. Now, it's not that little thing you see in the Catholic Church that's probably made in some factory somewhere and prepackaged and you know all of that it was a piece of unleavened bread that was baked with no yeast he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body they're celebrating Passover he takes this God given feast celebration holy day that commemorates the children or the people of God being delivered out of bondage and he applies it now to himself and he says this whole time the Jews have been celebrating something that points to their Messiah that points to me he says this for that they've been talking about that they've been reading about that they've been commemorating for 14 centuries now this is my body, which is broken for you. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink from it, all of you. 
this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit, from the vine, from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And then they sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. He takes that wine, and those cups had great significance. Now the Jews, their whole religious system ordained by God Himself was that of blood. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. All their lives, for 14 centuries up to the time of Jesus, priests had sacrificed animals, and the children, and the men, and the families, and the women had been taught, I have to take an animal and have it sacrificed for my sins to be right with God. And now Jesus goes on to say, I am the final sacrifice that will once and for all atone for all the sins of all mankind, pointing himself to be a sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What did Abraham say 14 centuries before? To Isaac, the Lord will provide on the mountain of the Lord it will provide it what else did he say God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering my son we're going to look at the crucifixion in the next weeks to come I find this interesting and it blows me away <laughs> we've looked at history and you know where Jesus was crucified? On Mount Calvary. And it is believed that that is the same exact spot where 14 centuries before his time, Abraham was going to offer up his son Isaac. It's on that mountain that God the Father placed the wood on the back of his only begotten son. He pinned him to a cross to become a sacrificial lamb to atone for our sin so that through his death, burial, and resurrection we can have forgiveness of sin and enter into heaven. Coincidence? I think not. So beautiful. Study your Bibles. Read in context. <laughs> Those stories that seem irrelevant way back, right, or, or in the Old Testament are extremely relevant when you read it in context and understand. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is through Him and Him alone, the Bible says, that we have forgiveness of sins and we have salvation. He did the hard part. All we need to do is surrender our lives to Him and believe in Him. And maybe this morning, those of you watching on the internet or listening wherever this goes or, or even here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're still in your sin. And you don't know that when you die, that if you'll go to heaven or if you'll go to hell. This morning, the Bible says Jesus came to set you free. We will read about Him being betrayed, about Him being crucified, dying, yes, buried, yes, but He resurrected the right hand of the Father. And because He lives, you will live the day that you die. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that if you believe in Him, you will not go to hell, but you will have eternal life. Pray with me this simple prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I ask You, Lord, to wash me and cleanse me by Your blood. And I now receive You as my Lord and my Savior. In the name of Jesus, I pray. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Next week, we look at the denial of Peter, but how Satan set him up. And we're going to learn a lot about how Satan will set us up and what Jesus tells Peter to do to overcome that as we will be tried, we will go through temptation, but we can resist it because God shows us how. God bless you and keep you.